So I don't know uh, what you think of chameleons. I love chameleons. Uh, they're really cool. They change color to blend into their surroundings. And um, the video just before uh, I kick off uh, is there to give us a reminder that we are not meant to blend in to our surroundings as Christians. We're meant to be salt and light. We're meant to be a city on a hill. We're meant to be different. And so as we think about uh, what it means to be the church today, I want to think about the culture that we're uh, trying to build and invest in and grow um, here at St. George's. Uh, so last week I talked about um, our, our vision and values, and, and we kind of had a refresh of the things we value, which um, Bible, worship, prayer, Holy Spirit, discipleship, and evangelism. So that was a six-point sermon. Uh, those of you that know the piece of paper I'm looking at, our culture, we've got five words. Uh, so this is a five-point sermon, so already it's shorter. Um, and, uh, you know, we spent a long time uh, trying to see if we could find words to define uh, what we wanted St. George's to feel like. And um, that's what culture is, how it feels in the place, what it's like when you walk in. Um, and uh, so we, we've got these five words, and I'm going to talk about each of those. As we have heard the reading from um, 1 Corinthians that reminds us that we are part of the body of Christ, and we all have a part to play in the body of Christ. Uh, so what is culture, and why is culture important? Um, any of you who have ever listened to anyone give any kind of management talk, business, anything like that, you will have heard this quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Now, I don't know what you had for breakfast this morning. I had some cereal and a cup of coffee, which is generally my breakfast every day, and I do it first thing in the morning. And the point of the quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast, is you can have the most wonderful strategies for how, as a church, you're going to reach the world, reach the community, make a difference, and all those things. But if your culture doesn't fit with that, then uh, by breakfast time, the strategy is gone. By breakfast time, the strategy is gone. So there's no point having a vision and a strategy if your culture isn't where it needs to be. And so culture is how a place feels. Culture is how, when you walk into a, a shop, for example, uh, how you feel when you walk in or you go to a restaurant, or a coffee shop, or a fast food chain, or a department store, or a grocery store. What does it feel like when you go in? You get a very different feeling when you walk into, say, a Thrifty Foods, which is such an ironic name, uh, a Thrifty Foods compared to a No Frills. You know, when you walk into No Frills, you know what you're getting. When you walk into a Thrifty Foods, you kind of have this expectation that it's going to somehow be a bit fancier. Um, certainly the prices are, hence the irony of the name. But there we go. Um, culture is how it feels when we go into a place. And so what does it feel like when we come into the church? We've said that the things we're passionate about are community, involvement, stewardship, innovation, and excellence. Those are the five words. Community, involvement, stewardship, innovation, and excellence. And if we were really clever, all those words would start with the same letter to make it easy to remember. But they don't, and so it can be hard to remember what the five words are because they don't all start with the same letter. But I think that's okay. Uh, because sometimes we in the church can think we've got to make everything uh, start with the same letter or feel like it's, you know, absolutely perfectly fits some kind of mnemonic or abbreviation. But I think what we said as a community is more important are these things, not the word we're using to describe them. So what do we mean by community? We have said we want to be a community of, of welcome and of care. So we, we're ready to welcome people when they come to experience church and faith for the first time or the hundredth time or the thousandth time, and we care for each other. And so my, one of my jobs 
I have many hats. One of my jobs as rector of the church is to help um, us as a church live out uh, these things which we've said we want to do. So you know how it goes. The ideas come out, and then parish council approves the thing, and then there's a, a nice piece of paper that has it all written down. Uh, but then I get to be the annoying person that says, why are we doing this? Why are we running that ministry? Because we want to reach into our community to welcome them into the church community so that people can know Jesus Christ because we believe that Jesus offers eternal life that begins now. He came, as I said last week, to give us life in all its fullness now. And so we're about helping people uh, experience that, living and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ as we put on our sign. Being the body of Christ means that we all have a part to play. Uh, the image I have, and I, I'm, I'm wary of using an image now, because if I say it now, you may think of nothing else, but um, I'm going to do it anyway because it fits with the point. Um, the image is the cruise ship versus a Navy ship. Uh, so if, you can, if you're a pacifist, just put, put aside for a second the, the concept of the Navy. But, but think of the, the two different kinds of ships. On a cruise ship, there are a few people who work very hard to give you everything you want so that you can have an amazing experience, an amazing journey. Also, they tend to start and finish in the same place. Not always, but they tend to go around in a big circle. On a Navy ship, every single person on the ship has a part to play. Everyone has a part to play. They all have to be involved. You can't be a passenger on a Navy ship, broadly speaking. Everyone has a part to play. And so when we think of the church... We can't have passengers. Well, we can, but a church that acts like a cruise ship is ineffective because some people end up doing all the work and they're exhausted and probably like cruise ship workers, overworked and underpaid, especially the volunteers. But in the Navy ship picture, everybody has a job. Everybody knows their job. And there might be some times when they're not working because they're not going to be 100% at it all the time. But everyone belongs. And without everyone on board, the ship cannot function as well as it is supposed to. We all have a job on the ship. We all have a part to play in the body of Christ. And that picture of the body that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 12 in the second half there, uh, it, it, it reminds us that every part of the body is interconnected and is valuable. So we want to foster a culture where everybody is involved. I remember uh, when I was at school, my head teacher, uh, principal, you would say, uh, would remind us on a frequent basis um, that there was never more than a thousand pieces of litter on the school site. And that if each of us every day picked up one piece of litter when we saw it, we would have the cleanest school in the county. And that stuck with me. And so even now, uh, I, I struggle to walk by litter. Um, and uh, you might say, well, David, you should carry a sack around and a thing. Or maybe I should, but I don't always. Uh, but if all of us play our part, we can make a difference. And conversely, if most of us don't play our part, we won't make a difference. For the church to live and share the good news of Jesus and reach into the whole community, it takes a team of people who are involved. Later on, Roxanne's going to do some announcements, and as one of those announcements, she's going to mention the Vacation Bible School, uh, which is coming up in August. And as part of that, she's going to say, hey, if you'd like to volunteer, there is an opportunity to do so. 
whether it's vacation Bible school or the art classes that are happening in the summer to welcome people into the space or baby cafe, which um, has finished now for the summer and other things will be happening and it will restart in the fall or whether it's Sunday services or life groups or people that volunteer around the building. Uh, there are many ways to be involved and it takes all of us to play our part so that we can reach the community and make a difference for Christ. And sometimes people say, well, I don't know what I can do. I'm old. Um, just an example, I've heard that a lot. I'm too old to volunteer. Um, I would say you're not. There is always something you can do. But um, one of the things we try and do here is we, there are some roles that have specific requirements. But we're not cookie-cutter people. And so um, we want to say, if there's a way that you feel called to serve, then have a conversation with myself or Roxanne or one of the wardens or Melody and say, hey, I'm interested in exploring, doing something. What can I do? Um, because it's no good us giving you a list of jobs and saying, which one of these would you like to do? We've tried that. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It's about what is it that you think you would like to do and how would you like to be involved? So, a community that welcomes and cares, a community that reaches out to our wider community in order to make a difference in the world for the sake of Jesus Christ. A community that is involved where everyone has a part to play in the body of Christ. Thirdly, stewardship. Stewardship is one of those words that means two things normally in the life of the church. You think of money and you think of the environment. And um, at best, us saying we want to be stewards who care for God's resources entrusted to us, we do both of those things. It's really, really, really important that when I and you give money uh, in the offering plate through pre-authorized debit, uh, through online giving, that we know that our money is being well spent, that the stewardship of the resources that we have as a church is good. And we work really hard to make sure that it is and that it's transparent and that when you have a question about, well, how is the church spending money, you can talk to the treasurer or one of the finance committees. The finance committee, is anyone. Um, but also stewardship is about how we look after the world God's given us. Uh, one of the things that we did um, a couple of years ago is we got rid of our ginormous garbage can. Um, we have saved uh, about, well, it's about $5,000 a year we were paying, and now we're paying about 200 So roughly, I've forgotten how many years ago it was now, if it's, if it's two years or three years, but we're somewhere between ten and $15,000 saved in the cost of getting rid of our garbage. And I had to negotiate getting us out of that contract and uh, which was ending, but still, um, if you've ever tried to negotiate with waste management companies, um, it, they, they really don't want to let you go. Um, and, uh, and it was just before Christmas, and it was utterly exhausting having the conversation, I'll be honest, because just before Christmas, that's the last thing I want to spend my time is talking about rubbish um, and the, uh, the, the garbage um, contract. But the person at the, at the company couldn't understand the concept that I said, if we don't have the, um, the, the garbage, it will cause us to look after what we have. We'll stop throwing away as much waste. Just didn't like that. I mean, of course she wouldn't like it. She was trying to sell us a massive container. But what happens as a result is not only have we saved ten to fifteen thousand dollars so far we also have dramatically reduced the amount of waste that we're sending to landfill because it's forced us to keep asking the question what can we reuse um, recycling is all well and good but uh, we want to be a church that uses real mugs every time rather than is using paper cups that are recycled, because probably they're not. So stewardship, and that is a cultural piece. It all ties together. It ties together because when I come to your house, 
if you invite me, which some of you do sometimes, typically you do not give me a drink in a paper cup. You'll give me a nice mug. Sometimes I've been to houses and I get the fine china experience. That's when I know that I'm definitely going as not David, but as the rector, because the fine china comes out. Um, anyhow. So we want to be a place where when people come in, we can welcome them, whether it's the first time or the hundredth time, where everyone has a part to play, everybody is involved, where um, our stewardship value means that we care for God's resources entrusted to us, and we find new ways of uh, caring for uh, both the planet and being very careful with the money we have. The fourth one is innovation. Innovation, we said, means trying new ideals boldly and, crucially, being okay with success and failure because we can learn from both. Churches that innovate move into new spaces in the life of the community. Churches that innovate grow. Churches that innovate make a difference in the world. Churches that don't innovate and are stuck in the past close, and they are closing. And I could name many of them within our diocese that are closing. When we hold on so much to our old traditions, it can tie us down. We want to honor tradition. We want to honor the history of the church. But we have to be careful that we don't worship the tradition. Innovation for us at St. George's has been part of the DNA of this place always. From when the church was planted in 1930 to when the church decided in the late 80s to move from the smaller wooden church in the middle of what was then Haney to a site undeveloped in East Maple Ridge. Some people accuse me of being the innovator and said, well, we're not very innovative, David, actually. It's just you, you're, you're innovative, so you can have this one because this is what you do. And I said, that's wrong. Because if this church wasn't innovative, why did you build a new building that was completely flat and accessible apart from the stage? That was completely flat and accessible so that there wouldn't be a barrier to people be there in a stroller or a wheelchair or a scooter or somebody with mobility issues. That was part of the vision and the innovation that St. George's had. And innovation through COVID meant that we kept going. Um, I think that's how we, frankly, have survived as well as we have as a church community during the COVID pandemic. Because we said, before COVID started, we, we were talking about these things, and we said, we want to have a culture of innovation. And innovation uh, meant that um, we set up cameras and started live streaming. And when we found that Facebook was changing their algorithms every week and stopping us doing things and canceling the service halfway through, we moved to YouTube. And when YouTube does the same, we'll find something else. Let's hope it doesn't, because it's working okay, I think. But we keep on innovating. And the final one, uh, which is everyone's favorite, is excellence. When I say it's everyone's favorite, a lot of people tell me they, they have trouble with the word excellence. Excellence, we've said, means taking care of the details for the glory of God. And um, I don't know if you've ever worked in retail, but there's a phrase, retail is detail. Um, and detail, for some people, is how you show them that you care. The kinds of details that we have in the church are the fact the pews are all facing the same way, they're not perfectly aligned. As I stand here, I can see they're not perfectly aligned. There is no such thing as perfection in a church. We will never be perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. But we can strive for excellence. We can take care of the details. And so more or less, they're all facing the same way. They're all about at the same angle. They're all about at the same distance apart. And the side ones, they've all been carefully put with, with a particular angle so that it reduces your neck strain. 
Now, for some people, when I start talking about details, that just sounds really boring. But it's the kind of stuff that, I don't know if you ever watch advertisements for car companies, especially I find German car companies, they can be fanatical about detail of switches and buttons. Or if you go into Ikea, and they have those things where they'll show you where they test the furniture, and they show how many times the cupboard door has been open and shut, because they're testing the details. Now, not all of us particularly care when we buy our kitchens or our, um, our closet drawers or things like that. We don't care. We just want something that works. And the same applies to the church. We don't want to walk in here and be distracted from our worship by the fact that the pews are all randomly arranged in the room. We want to come in and feel the space is inviting and ready for us to worship. Taking care of the details for the glory of God means we keep on innovating and trying new things. We keep on working out when something isn't quite working. How could we do that better? We've done that so much in the technological realm in terms of how the services work. But that excellence plays out in other ways. It's the wonderful cards that Dylan designed for Vacation Bible School that when you look at them, uh, they look like they've been designed by a professional graphic designer. I don't know, maybe Dylan does graphic design on the side professionally, but um, I don't think so. And yet, that kind of detail, that kind of excellence, helps say to the community, we take things seriously. We're not just putting out something that's been scribbled on a piece of paper and run through a photocopier and colored in with a felt tip pen. We're trying to put out something where there is a sense of excellence. Why? Because it's for God's glory. And as we gather as the church, all this is for God's glory. I can give you so many examples of excellence that I'll bore you to sleep, so I won't. But if you ask me later, I can tell you some of the little things. I'll tell you one final one. Underneath this stand, there is a tiny black square of tape. And that tiny black square of tape tells me where to put the middle of the stand to make sure that I'm in the right place for the camera. What's that got to do with worship? Well, it would be very distracting for the camera people if every week I, I was in a slightly different place. And sometimes I move around, and they do, they do love that. We want to take care of the details so that we can focus on glorifying God. And we're going to get it wrong. We're going to mess up. There's going to be times when someone comes in and they, they feel unwelcomed in our church, and they feel this is not a welcoming place, and we'll have failed. And that's okay. Next week, we'll try again. We'll try and do better. Typically, when someone isn't, doesn't feel welcomed in the church, it's because people are so happy to see each other that they miss the newcomer coming in. There's going to be times when a whole bunch of people aren't involved. And that's okay. We can take time. We can fix it. We can find ways to involve people. There may be a season in your life when you think, I can't be involved right now. Back to my ship image. On the cruise ship, by definition, most people are not involved. On the Navy ship, by definition, most people are involved. However, there will be people who are on the Navy ship with broken legs and broken arms, and they can't carry out their job, but they're still there and they're still part of the team. And for a season, the ship will carry on with them in, in whatever state they're in. But we can't stay like that forever, otherwise we become the cruise ship. There will be times when we mess up with our stewardship, when we spend some money and we could have spent it slightly better. There will be times when we have to make a decision uh, that is not the, the best decision for the environment, for God's creation. And so we have grace for one another. There will be times when we fail to innovate. Uh, it's difficult to keep on innovating. In COVID, it was exhausting, the continuous need to keep on innovating and trying new things all the time to try and make sure we were meeting people's needs. There are times when we don't innovate. 
And there are always times when we could say we fail to achieve the excellence goal. But that is the difference between perfection and excellence. Why does all this matter? Because if we want to live and share the good news of Jesus, we need to know what we're inviting people to. We need to not be like the chameleon that looks like the world. We need to look Jesus Christ shaped in our lives as a church and as the church community. We need to be a place that's different so that when we invite people to come in, they experience a sense of heaven, a sense that God is closer than they realize, a sense that they are more loved than they realized they were. The wonderful thing about the church is that it takes a whole group of people all playing a part, all playing different parts. And as we work together, we can reach our community. In the name of Jesus. Amen.